continue in um, our Life and Doctrine series called The Church. Last week we looked at family, and the family jumped in, and two weeks before that I started on this idea of why the church? Why is the church such a big deal? And I'm going to pick up a part two of that um, this morning. Um, like I said, I've had a lot of energy and a lot of kind of spiritual uh, noise in my soul over this, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I just got back from Africa. Many of you have heard that um, A Light to the Nations did a gospel festival in Iganga, Uganda. And uh, one of the things that was really cool is we got to get to know the, uh, the mayor of Iganga. Um, and he's a great godly man. And he came to the hotel a couple of times. We met and we were just kind of just talking about his city and, and needs and stuff. He's also um, this really strong Christian. And um, he was telling us that, uh, that the churches there, the churches in Iganga, um, really felt, um, felt like they were like oppressed. Um, there was not a lot of joy in the churches. There was not a lot of power in the churches. And so he was thanking us for bringing them together and doing this big gospel outreach because he felt like that was going to really um, embolden the church and kind of uh, get the church going. And um, as he was talking about some of the struggles that, that local, th those local churches have, we had about 200 churches that were involved in the festival. Um, as he was talking about it, and he was describing how the people were really having a hard time feeling powerful and feeling empowered in the church, um, it was resonating with me. Uh, it was resonating with my heart and, and the American churches. And um, one of the things the Lord's just been speaking to me is really the power and the purpose and the beauty that is in the church. Amen? And what he's after from us. And you know, one of the things that I just keep feeling is like, until, until the church becomes like this beautiful, um, awesome bride of Christ, like th this beautiful highest common denominator thing in our lives, meaning until the church becomes like, like the most important thing that we do, right? Worship Jesus and love the church. Until the church gets up there in rank in regards to how we regard her, um, the, the Spirit of God is not really, really moving in the church yet. Amen? And I just really feel like for these next messages, what the Lord is doing is he's, he's, he's stoking our affections for her, the church. Because like Iganga, I think the church all over the world is really struggling to find her footing. Um, the church is really struggling to find her voice. And I, don't, I just feel like it's just something that the Lord's doing right now where he's just stoking our affections for the, for the body of Christ. Amen? So that's what I'm doing. Um, by the grace of God, I'm talking about the beauty of the church and getting stoked and getting excited about the church. Amen? And so I'm going to continue that and uh, definitely takes the Holy Spirit. No one loves the church more than the Holy Spirit. And so when he gets a hold of us and shows us what he sees, um, that's what we uh, get excited about. So I started out two weeks ago. Why the church? She, the church, um, is the great link between heaven and earth. Amen? She is the means to the end of our prayer on earth as it is in heaven. She is the body of Christ. She is the way that Jesus is moving through the world. In her is found the witness of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God. And when she is operating at full strength, she is tearing down demonic strongholds, and she is building kingdom. Amen? And so this morning, what I want to, I want to continue in that, on that train, and I want to look at how the how. If that's who she is, how does she do that? How does she bridge the gap between heaven and earth? And what are some of the ways that God uniquely equips her for that work? You know, she is like nothing else. Amen? The church is like nothing else. She is beautiful, and she is glorious, and she is the wisdom of God on earth. And so I want to lift her up. I want to find the glory of God in her. I want us to find our place in her and to be excited about her. Amen? Okay. Um, our scripture is the same scripture I started out with two weeks ago. I'm going to read it again. I'll pray, and we'll jump into the word this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians 1, uh, verses 15 through 23. This is Paul to the Ephesians. Um, great theology, uh, great thoughts about the church in the book of Ephesians. Uh, verse 1, 15 through 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, we're talking about loving the church, I do not cease to give thanks to, for you, remembering you always in my prayers, 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have a big vision for her. She's your bride. She's your power. She's your glory on earth, Lord. Heavenly Father, I feel like she's been tarnished, and I feel like she, I'm just jealous for her. By, by your Spirit, Lord, I'm jealous for her, Lord. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in us this morning during this word, that you would move in us, Lord, that you would stoke up your affections for her through us, Lord, that you would show us how powerful we are when we are in her and operating in her. Lord, I pray for nothing short of a paradigm shift in our heart toward our mind for us to really, really see that we are a member of, we are a part of, we partake of, we are glorying in the most powerful move that has ever been on the planet, and that is your church. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would move even now, Lord, to switch us off of anything less than white-hot affection for her. Because, Lord, you love her and you call us to her and you call us to serve her with a pure and sincere faith that is unfailing, that is sacrificial. And, Lord, we can't do it without your Spirit. I think we try, but, Lord, we can't. And so, Heavenly Father, we lift you up, we glorify you, we see your word, we see your way, we see your will in the church, and we want to grab a hold of that and run with it. So, Heavenly Father, we glorify you and lift you up, in Jesus, who is the husband of her, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Man, when you start preaching your prayers. All right, there's three things I want to talk about the church. The church is so unique, there's nothing like her, she's amazing. Um, she does things in and through us that we could never have imagined outside of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the first thing. And you can write these down. This is number one. She must be humble in the world. Number one is, she must be humble in the world. It's a demand on us to be humble in the world. A primary purpose of the church is to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen? We see that in Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 46. We see um, in every one of the Gospels, and we see it carried in the book of Acts, that Jesus calls the church, calls her to go and spread the Gospel. In Luke 24, it says, Thus it is written that, that Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are my witness to these things. So Jesus does his earthly ministry, lives a perfect life, uh, gives his life um, for the sake of her, um, dies, is in the tomb for three days, rises again, comes back and says, guess what? You're going to tell everybody about me. You're going to tell everybody about repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And you're going to start in Jerusalem, and you're going to go out from there, right? So he gives this calling on us to spread the gospel to all the world. Um, we've talked about it a little bit. About one-third of the world still has yet to hear the name of Jesus. So we're still doing this job here 2,000 years later. <laughs> and I laugh at this because it's a pretty hard job. Amen? So we have to go into the world and tell people that they are sinners and that they need to repent. Awesome. Um. I don't know about you, but I wish it would have been like, I want you to go into all the world and give them all ice cream. Give them, yeah. <laughs> give them all ice cream, any flavor they want. They won't gain any weight and just tell them God loves them. Ice cream. You can pick whatever flavor you want. 
Uh, I was in downtown Chicago. Don't you wish it was different, right? It's like he says, go out and like proclaim the forgiveness of sins and repentance and, and tell the world that they are sinful and fallen and um, they, they, uh, they will suffer eternal hell, hellfire if they don't repent. That's a hard thing, right? But I wish it was something else, don't you? I was downtown Chicago a couple years ago and there was a group and they had a sign that said free hugs. Anybody ever see the free hugs people? I'm like, that's pretty awesome. I was kind of feeling down, kind of feeling low. I got a hug. For about two blocks, I was on top of the world. Block three, it all came back. You know what I mean? But I wish that Jesus would have said, listen, I want you to go out and give hugs to all the world. Hug everyone. Go everywhere. Hug. You know, I think that'd be awesome. But what if he said, just go out and be nice. I want you to go to all the world and raise your family and be nice and just, you know, be hospitable and um, just make sure you invite them over sometimes. That'd be sweet. But no, Jesus says, I want you to go to all the world. I want you to tell them they're sinners. I want you to show them that I died for them. I want you to tell them that they need me, and if they don't have me, they perish, and they're already perishing. I want you to do that. Huh. That sounds harder than the other ideas I had. I've asked God to change up his... Right? And how do we do that, right? Like, how do we, how do we go into the world and tell the world they need Jesus, and if they don't get Jesus, they're in trouble? I, it just... I mean, no wonder why not many of us do it, right? It's just not a good job. It's not fun. No one wants to be told that they're a bad person, right? Unless you're into that kind of thing. But anyway, but, but how do we do that? Like, how do we go and share the love of Christ in a way that's humble? Because we have to do it. We have to be humble or we won't be heard. Well, I think that John really nails this in his first letter, 1 John 4.10. It says, in this is love. And we're talking about how do we love the world with the gospel, right? In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment for our sins. And then he goes on in that same chapter and says, we love because he first loved us. Amen? And I don't know about you, but for me, when I go and tell someone, hey, look, there's this Jesus and he died for you and he died for me. And in, in me, there is, no, there is no love for you. But because I've been loved first, Um, Because he went ahead of me, because he showed me the way through his sacrifice for me, that's why I can tell you about him. Amen? There's no, there's nothing, there's no like self-starter love kit in Tony Woodall. Promise you. There's no like wake up and really, really love people. Like if I'm not loved by God first, if you're not loved by God first, if the church is not loved by Jesus first, you can't give what you ain't got. Amen? And so I think that the way that we find our humility, find our humble way in the gospel proclamation, which is our calling, I think the way, one of the ways that we find it is to realize that we were loved first, amen? And we're just sharing what we got. We're just sharing, look, man, look, I was a sinner. I was a sinner. I was a wretched sinner. And now I'm a sinner saved by grace. Isn't that awesome? That's how we tell the world about Jesus. The gospel is not that we love first, but that he loved us, amen? That's how we do it. But there's more to this calling. Because there's another calling on the church. Because we have a gospel call. We have a call to go out and to bring the gospel to all the corners of the world. Amen? But we have another calling too, and that's to fix the whole world. Fix the whole world. No big deal. Go tell everyone they're a sinner and then fix everything. Cool. All right. Here's Jesus opening up his ministry, and he's going to tell people what he's about, and he's going to tell people what they're going to be about who follow him after. Luke 4. He's a... Quoting uh, Isaiah, I think. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. This is Jesus talking in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the gospel death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's the outcome, is that everyone who is in him would go and serve the poor, they would go and free the oppressed, they would go and serve the widows and orphans, they would go establish equal rights on this earth, they would have what sometimes is called a social justice cause on the earth. Amen? So we have this calling to go and give the gospel of salvation and repentance, and we also have this calling to go and work and work and work until the world is one, until the world is equitable, until the world is just, until all the world proclaims the goodness of God through its systems, um, through its governments. Amen? 
So we have a big calling. Now, how many of us know that though the gospel, the proclamation of forgiveness of sins is unique to the church, the social justice thing is not unique, right? Are there other organizations out there? Are there other people? Are there other groups? Are there other governments that are going out and seeking to bring justice and seeking to set free the oppressed and seeking to establish righteousness on earth outside of Christ? Are there? Yeah. Just check out the Oprah Network. She's doing it. There's a ton of people, there's a ton of groups out there that are going out there and doing good work. They're trying to do good work. They're trying to make a difference. But they have a challenge that the church does not have. They have a disadvantage that the church does not have. And this is what it is. And I've been feeling this a lot. And Lord, I just pray for grace to bring this right. Pursuing social justice apart from a salvation message will create a false moral superiority. Pursuing social justice, doing good things, apart from being saved by grace through faith in Christ, will bring about a false moral superiority. There is an emboldened pride that comes from trying to fix mankind without first recognizing that we need to be fixed in Christ. Amen? There is an emboldened pride that rises up in us when we try to fix the world without realizing that Jesus needs to fix us first. When all of our good works are born out of some self-willed good in us, in and of ourselves, a very ugly form of self-righteousness rises up. It's called false moral superiority, and it takes over our cause. And when we go this way, which is good works without the good Savior, when we go this way, we become the good people, and anyone who doesn't get on board with us, they become the bad people. See the problem? If I believe that there is good in and of myself, if I believe that I am anything more than a sinner saved by grace from the start of my good works, everything that I do will be based upon my goodness. Everything that you don't do or you won't do is based upon your goodness. And so if I rise up for some cause or for some higher calling and I rise up in my own goodness, I now am superior to you and I can now dictate who you should be, how you should be, what you should care about. Amen? So much of the problem in the American system right now, so much of the problem is we have people rising up in their own self-proclaimed self-righteousness, trying to do good works, and they're causing this pride swell to happen in the, in the world and to happen in our country, and people can't respond because you know what? People don't like feeling like they're morally inferior to you. And what the church has, the value that the church has, the unique way that God built it, he says, look, I want you to go out, I want you to fix the world. I want every slave to be free, I want every blind eye opened, I want every child educated, I want every child to eat, I want every woman to have opportunity, I want you to go do all that, do what Jesus did, but do it from the place of understanding that I did it for you first. Amen? It changes the whole paradigm. Serving for good causes from a position of redeemed aligns our heart to a pure motive. Amen? It's that place that says, look, I don't have it all figured out. I was a sinner saved by grace, and now I see it Jesus' way, and he wants right in the world. And so with the gospel of salvation comes the gospel of social justice. And when those work together, they complement each other beautifully. And that's uniquely designed for her, the church. Amen? And so when I'm saying that the church needs to be humble when she spreads the gospel and when she seeks to fix the world, I'm saying that we love, we love because he first loved us. We're not standing on some pedestal of self-superiority. Amen? We get to be humble and we get to be of good works too. Amen? Isn't that brilliant for God to do? Ah, that's the first one. The works of God through the church are going to take humble people. And that's uniquely for us to understand. Are we good? Deep breath. All right. That's number one. <laughs> Got two more. Let's see, we're doing pretty good on time. 
All right, so that, that's, so the, the church needs to be humble toward the world. That's number one, and there's, because we have that dichotomy. The second thing is, is the church makes her members great and makes her members humble. Okay? The second thing is, is that the church makes her members great. And at the same time that, she, that, he make, that, that, that God makes the members of the church great, God also makes each member humble. So there's greatness and humility in contrast in the church. I'll explain that. We read in 1 Peter 2.9 some of the most glorious um, descriptions of her, the church. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But you, that's, that's all of the, anyone who believes in Christ, and, right? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. In summary, you're a big deal. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, excellencies of him, say that five times real fast, excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a royal priesthood, amen? You are a holy nation, amen? You are God's very, God the creator. Noel was just praying that the same God who created out of nothing loves us, cares for us. We are his possession. We are his bride. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're his own possession. And we proclaim the excellencies of that God to the world and tell the story of how we went from darkness to light. Amen? Big deal. You can't feel low. You can't feel down. You can't feel less than when Peter puts that on you as your identity. Amen? We're a big deal. We together are awesome, right? Those words, they have plurality. A royal priesthood. Not a royal priest, a royal priesthood. We are members of this priesthood. We are a holy nation. Plurality. We proclaim his excellencies. Together we are awesome. Together when we are working in unity, we are greatness. We are great. Amen? But as individuals, we are lowly. It's brilliant. I love her. Jesus was teaching about how the kingdom was going to work. Jesus was telling the disciples who were always fighting over who was the greatest, right? Amen? And we kind of judge them, but we do the same thing. Anyway, maybe you don't. Pray for me. Okay, all right. If the shoe fits, wear it. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, Jesus is teaching how the church is going to be a great, a great organization. The church is going to be the, the power of God on earth. The church is going to rip down the strongholds of Satan. It's going to um, break down the gates of hell. The church is going to be the way that heaven meets earth. And he says, and I want you to know how it's going to be organized. I want you to see how individuals are going to be within this great, awesome power. He says this in Matthew 20. Jesus called his disciples and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. For even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Royal priesthood, holy nation, awesome people, unstoppable force, filled with individuals who serve, individuals who love the person next to them more than they love themselves, the person who doesn't get too high in themselves and understands that they're a servant. Amen? Brilliant. That, that's the church right there. Paul goes on to say in Romans 12, he likes to hammer those points home, man. He just makes the gospel real, you know? He says in Romans 12, 3, I love the way he starts it. For the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than they ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And in case that's too many words, he finishes it up in verse 16 and says, don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Uh, you know, there's something really beautiful and relieving to be able to come, be a member of a church, and just be a person. Amen? 
There is no gift that is greater. Paul, went, we're going to go through that later, but there is no gift that is greater. There is no position that is greater. I mean, our Lord and Savior, the guy who started the whole thing, died naked on a tree. That's the aim, man. If we want to be great, go for that. There's no way to like lift yourself up and to become greater than the person next to you. There's no way to do that when you have a Savior who did that for you. There's no way for us to be great on ourselves in a body of Christ. Amen? There's no way around it. We're called to be lowly and humble toward one another. And so we see this dichotomy where she, the collective, is great, high, lifted up, awesome, beautiful, powerful. She, the collective, also holds within her these humble servants. Amen? That, to me, is brilliant. That's beautiful. If we want to feel great, if we want to feel awesome, feel awesome about her collective. Amen? And if we want to get humble, and if we want to see how Jesus really walked, serve her the way that he did. Amen? Collective greatness, individual humility. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine this week about this idea, you know, and I said, look, I love the church for this. I love that she reminds me of my greatness, and she reminds me of my humility. Uh, you know, there have been times in my life, there, there have been times even recently where I have just felt so low. Um, not so low like individual, but so low, L-O-W. Um, I have felt like low. I have felt like I messed up and there's nothing that God can do to fix it. I have felt worthless. I have felt that I just couldn't see a path. Have you ever felt that way that you just as an individual, you just can't get above the mess, you know? And I felt that way. I felt that way. And her, the church, never lets me stay there. Amen? I called a friend out in, in California, and I just, I told her, I said, look, I, this is what I feel. And she's like, shut up. <laughs> let me tell you what I see. Because this is what's so beautiful about the church. When you get alone, and when you start beating yourself up, and the devil loves that, when you start beating yourself up, all you got to do is just call the person next to you. Just call someone out in your church, and they won't let you do that for too long. And they'll be quasi-nice about it, too. But they won't let you because they love you, and they have the Holy Spirit in them, and they have an affection for you in Christ, and so they won't let you get down on yourself when you reach out to her. And so, in one sense, the church does not allow me to self-deprecate. The church does not allow me to put myself in a lower place. The church reminds me of who I am in Christ over and over and over again every day. Amen? And she also doesn't let me get too high on myself. I don't know about you, but maybe you struggle with pride sometimes. Um, maybe you struggle to understand that your thing isn't the greatest thing. You know, like I have it written in my notes. I'll just read the notes, okay? I'll just read my own self <laughs> There have been times in my life when I've had a pretty high lofty opinion of myself. You're like, no, Tony, no, not you. But I've worked on it and I'm proud of my humility now. I've <laughs> really been hard. No. There have been times in my life where I've had a pretty lofty opinion of myself. My gifts, my calling, my ideas, my things. Um, and every time I get high on myself and the things that I'm called to, and I try to get people on board with my thing, the church reminds me to get on board with her thing. Every time I want to rise up above and think that I'm better, the church reminds me to submit those things for the greater glory. Because the things that you have in your life to do and the things that I have in my life to do, take the church to do them, amen? And so what I love about this, this, this beautiful God and this beautiful church is that she ain't going to let you get too low and she's not going to let you rise above her. You're going to be in this beautiful, glorious union with her in greatness and humility, amen? That's the second thing. This is the last one. This is the best one. So the first one was, let me remind, when you have to remind yourself, that means it's confusing. Let me go back real quick here. The first point, let me write it down. Yeah, the church needs to be humble in the world. And the second one is what? And humble. Thank you. That's a good word right there. All right, moving on. <laughs> okay, here's the third one. Um, she will be perfect one day. Amen. 
She will be perfect one day. Um, there's a great, uh, wives like to use this, I mean, like to re- reference this. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, don't be laughing, it's all right. This is a, this is a reference to uh, how Christ loves the church, okay? <laughs> it says in Ephesians 5, uh, verse 25 through 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives, amen? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now watch what he's doing. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Is the church fully sanctified? No. Is she without spot or wrinkle or blemish? Will she be? Will Jesus have his way with her? Will he see his bride become what he saw in his mind when for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross? He's going to win, amen? He's going to win. I tell you, I've been in a lot of, (laughs) I've been in some church dynamics, okay? Uh, I've I've been in some church things here at the Edge. I've been in some church things with other churches. Um, I've been in international ministry. Um, I can tell you that this vision that Jesus has for her is not there yet. Amen? Yeah, I can promise you that if I show up, it's not there yet. All right? So, um, uh, you know, I feel like one of the reasons why people, elect to be Christians, but not elect to be in the church, which, by the way, theologically is impossible, but I'm not going to chase that right now. Um, The people, they elect to be Christians, but they don't want to be a part of a church. One of the reasons um, that they do that is because they say that she's not perfect. They say that she's filled with hypocrites. They say that she's filled with um, people who are greedy and people who are simple or people who don't understand the real problems of the world. Or, you know, and you see all these Christians heaping all this blame on her, not realizing, first of all, that she's married to someone. His name is Jesus. And second of all, that he is perfecting her and he's going to perfect her and he's not going to stop until it's done. So I think one of the big things that we have to get this morning is that we are not Christians who are somehow holier than thou and outside of the church. We are Christians being perfected in her, through her, by her, for her. Amen? Man, if you want to go looking for problems in the church, just, you can find them. Let me just give you a couple in case you need to get started. You can Google these. You can Google these. Are you ready? Um, Is there false doctrine in the church? You can Google that. There's a lot of false, really, really weird stuff in the church, man. There's a lot of false doctrine. One of the big reasons why we're doing life and doctrine is because we're trying to course correct via the Bible. We're trying to course correct some of the false doctrine in the church. Amen? There's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of greed. Is there greed in the church? You want the sevenfold anointing? Seven dollars a day for 77 days. I saw that. Seven dollars a day for 77 days is the sevenfold anointing. Sounds awesome. I don't even know what it means, but it sounds like it'll work, you know? A lot of greed in the church, a lot of pride. Oh, man, superstar pastors, superstar saints, churches that are bigger than other churches and church comparisons and power struggles in the church. Are there power struggles? Oh, man, envy, jealousy, bickering, rivalries, deceit, malice, confusion. Man, is the church confused today? Like, man, the church is confused. So if you want to, like, Google up, if you want to Google up some problems in the church, there's a couple search terms. I'm telling you right now, it ain't going to be hard to find. But here's what I know. There's something else working in the church today, and his name is Jesus. Amen? He is a lover and a perfect lover. He is a perfect husband. He's going to have his way. He's going to win. His blood was too perfect, and his spirit is too powerful to leave us like we are. Amen? Amen? His blood is too perfect, and his spirit is too powerful to leave us where we are. He's raising us up in him. He's going to win. The conclusion's going to be perfect, spotless, without blemish, beautiful bride that he saw in his heart when he went and died on the tree. Amen? He's going to have his way. Look, there are a lot of forces at work in the church right now. There's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of liars. There's a lot of deception. There's a lot of reasons to opt out of her. But listen, she's going to get there, and she's going to get there with you. And if you're there, then she can be perfected as well. 
We are called to be a part of the perfection process of being in the church, mutually submitting to one another until we all get there together. And so I pray for and I really admonish anyone who is outside of her but in Christ to get in with her and realize that he's going to win. You have a perfect husband. We're going to get there together. Amen? <sighs> All right. Amen. Those were my three points. That's what I got. Band, come up. <laughs> come on up, band. Didn't have a great closing on this one. <laughs> Anyway, I've been preaching a lot, you know. But anyway, so, but that's the point, right? Like, the church needs to be humble because we have this really, really snarky message of, like, you're a sinner, <laughs> you know? We do. But when we realize that we are saved by grace, that's an easy message to give. And when we go out and save the world, we do that as redeemed saints, not super powerful, self-righteous people. Amen? We go out there as redeemed saints. And as we gather together, we feel the greatness of her moving through us in the Holy Spirit, but we also sense the humility and we sense the servant heart of each individual. Amen? Beautiful. And lastly, though she ain't perfect, and if you wanted to look for it, you'd find problems, she's going to get there because she has a perfect husband whose blood and whose spirit are the trump card of every problem. Amen? Let's rise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that this is your plan. This is plan A. As someone was praying, Ryan Van Campen was praying this morning, Lord, that you could have done it some other way. You could have fixed the world and brought your glory down in some other way, Lord, but you're not giving up on her because you died for her, and you're going to see us through, Lord. I pray that everyone who does not feel the fullness of the grace and love that is for her and then unites with her in service, Lord, I pray that all of them would see what you see, an imperfect but being perfected bride who will one day be perfect in you. Lord, I pray that we would just grab a hold of that vision. Lord, that we would have a renewed vigor. Lord, that we would have a renewed passion to love you and serve you, your people. Lord, that we could just lay it all down. Lord, not even counting the cost, Lord, because we know that it's costly. But Lord, I pray that we could just lay it all down and just know that there's an eternal benefit and an eternal weight of glory on us when we mutually submit in love and service to each other for your greater glory, the church. So, Lord, we just lift you up, glorify you. We ask you, Lord, to continue in this spirit, to continue in this work, Lord, that we would be um, called up into greater glory of understanding who you are in the church, Lord, and that we would see ourselves, our individual selves, in her, understanding what we're called to be for her. Lord, we just pray for a release of all that. And, Lord, you can do more than we can ask or think, so it's not a big thing to ask you. And all the people said, amen.